This is the 2021 M1 iMac. It's Apple's M1 refresh of their old 21 inch 4K iMac. I've had this iMac since the day it launched. But the question is, are the flashy colors just for show? Or is there some substance to this iMac? Should you buy this iMac? Is it worth your hard earned cash? Well, let's find out with a little review. When you open the box, you'll get the iMac itself, a 10 keyless version of the Bluetooth Magic Keyboard, a Magic Mouse, a braided magnetic power adapter, and a braided USB-C to lightning cable to charge the Magic Keyboard and Magic Mouse. Side note, the Magic Mouse still has to be flipped over like a dead cockroach to be charged. The M1 iMac starts at $1,300 US, but the middle priced model introduces an Ethernet port on the power brick and has four USB 4 ports instead of the two that's found on the base model. Other than that, the only minor difference is that the middle model and higher spec model have eight graphics cores instead of seven, meaning it'll do better in graphic intensive tasks like photo editing, video editing, and playing games just for a few examples. The iMac also now comes in seven different colors, blue, green, pink, silver, yellow, orange, and purple. The backs of the iMacs are bolder shades of the colors that you find on front of the device. So if you have a green one, it goes from a minty green to a tealish color. If you have the pink one, it goes from this light pink up front to this vibrant red on the back. The one I obviously have here is the pink one because my wife will be trying to steal this device from me after this review. I'll be having a funeral for my wallet at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning if anyone wants to attend. You'll notice that the accessories that come with the M1 iMac matches the body of the iMac itself. The bodies of the keyboard and mouse are pink. The braided power cable and provided charging cable are also pink. And the magnetic part that attaches to the back of the iMac matches the back too. But the color matching doesn't stop just there. The stickers you get are color matched to the iMac and the wallpapers and color scheme of the UI of the Mac are defaulted to also color match with your particular model. So here, everything is pink or red. Looking within the iMac's settings and even on the Find My app, the Mac is the exact same color as the model you purchased. To be honest, those type of things add real no benefit. It's all cosmetic, but you have to admit, that's a nice touch. The body of the iMac is much more flat than last year's model. The M1 iMac now looks like a stretched out iPad slapped on a cheap Amazon iPad stand, but it does still have a headphone jack. And the front now has a thinner but white bezel. The entire front is a giant sheet of glass, unlike before where the bottom bezel was aluminum. The sides, backside, and stand are aluminum with a giant Apple logo on the back. And since it's an all-in-one computer, there's only a power cable that sticks out of it leaving you a really clean and minimal looking desk. Overall, people seem to be mixed about the design of the iMac, but I like it. The white bezels blend in real well in a room since the majority of my walls are white and the space this particular iMac is going into, a room where the majority of decor is pink, it makes perfect sense. These iMacs feel like they're supposed to be in living areas and not shoved into the corner. And that's what Apple showcases in all of their marketing materials for this machine. There's different colors for wherever you're planning to place this device. Is the look for everyone? Definitely not. For me personally though, I like it. It reminds me of the old iMac G3s I used to use in the school computer labs when I was five years old. That may just be nostalgia talking or maybe I'm old now, but I'm here for it. But I can definitely see why people are upset though. There's no black or space gray color that would make the iMac look more like other traditional all-in-one computers. All right, enough about how it looks. What's it like using it? The screen is glossy and is nice to look at. It's a 24 inch 4.5K display and gets plenty bright. The USB 4 ports are still on the back and are still as annoying as ever to reach behind and try to plug something in. The speakers sound great considering how thin the overall machine is and the webcam got upgraded to 1080p, which is a huge upgrade over the previous model 720p one. And this is how the mics on the M1 iMac sounds as well in a regular room with no sound treatment. But like previous models, the screen can only be tilted up and down, unlike monitors with stands that let them do some Olympic level gymnastics. If you're a tall person, you'll want the iMac on a stand so that you can sit up straight and not strain your neck looking down, leading to a double chin and looking like a certain Star Wars character. The Magic Keyboard feels like their other Magic Keyboards, 
but now it has a fingerprint sensor on the middle and higher end models that look like it was ripped off of an old iPhone. The fingerprint sensor works well enough though, just like the ones on other M1 Max. The mouse? Well, it's the same one Apple has had for a while now. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of it because I like to hold my mouse kind of, one second. I like to hold my mice kind of like this where uh, my palm is rested and I arch my fingers a little. With the Magic Mouse, I feel like I'm straining my hand more. If you don't like it either, then I think the Logitech MX Anywhere in pink fits well with this iMac in pink. Or if you don't have a pink iMac, they also have a silver variant that fits well with the silver iMac. Performance wise, since the M1 iMac, well, has the M1 ARM processor, it performs similarly to other M1 Macs, like the M1 Mac Mini, MacBook Air, and M1 MacBook Pro. So it has all the benefits and negatives of the M1 as well. The performance of the chip has been looked at in detail by many other channels. So there's definitely no need for me to echo what they probably do better. So instead, I'll just give a quick overview of the M1 to save us both some time. Here's what I said on my M1 MacBook Air review on performance. Usually when a situation like this happens, you know, like a switch to different types of processors, like in this case, x86 to ARM, you normally would lose access to using old software. But in the case of the M1 Max, they can run old x86 apps and games because they utilize some hardware and software features to convert that old x86 version of apps and softwares to the new ARM version through a tool they call Rosetta 2. So that sounds really cool on paper, but how does that work in real life? Well, when you open an older app that isn't on the newer ARM platform, then the app will do a one-time setup where it kind of bounces up and down on the dock a little longer than usual. This can take up to a few minutes. But after that, moving forward, every time you press on it, it would open instantly like always and run as if nothing has changed. But keep in mind that running old x86 apps and software will drop the Mac performance anywhere from 20 to 30%. Until you realize that that would still make the M1 MacBook Air running software that isn't written for it, about as fast as the base model 16 inch MacBook Pro. When it comes to GPU performance, the same thing applies. Older x86 apps will run slower. Shadow the Tomb Raider, a game I feel is always used as a benchmark instead of actually being played, is one of the few heavy games I could test on this thing. It runs decently at 54 FPS on lowest settings after around four runs of the built-in benchmark. Would I recommend gaming on the M1 chip? Well, light gaming, like esports titles, are probably your best bet. Things like web browsing, photo editing, and video editing, I've had no issues with. I edit multiple streams of 4K video on top of each other on this channel and regularly on my M1 MacBook Air, and it does it fine. And it's the same on the M1 iMac. I've started editing a lot of videos on there as well, and I've experienced the exact same thing. The only time it does struggle during video editing is that when I go into maximum overdrive and cut my edits really, really quickly. The other cool feature of the M1 is that it allows the iMac to run supported iOS apps as well though this does come at a trade-off. You currently can't run Windows on your Mac through Bootcamp anymore. That's because Windows is based on the x86 platform. There is an ARM version of Windows, but it's not supported yet. Okay, so now, before we get to the conclusion of this video, I wanna talk about the comparison people make between the M1 Mac Mini and M1 iMac. The Mac Mini has the exact same M1 chip, so performance-wise, they're about equal but the M1 Mac Mini is significantly cheaper because it's just the computer itself. It's a little square box. It doesn't have a mouse, it doesn't have a keyboard, it doesn't have a webcam, it doesn't have a display, it doesn't have speakers. All of those would need to be accounted for in the cost of owning a Mac Mini if you didn't already have them. And when you do have them, it's gonna leave a ton of cables all over your desk because all those things have to be connected to the device somehow. On the M1 iMac, all of that is either wireless or already integrated onto the machine. On the other hand, the M1 iMac, when it's time for it to be replaced, you have to replace the whole thing since you can't just rip the display, webcam, and speakers off to use with the new computer you buy. With the M1 Mac Mini, just replace the little $700 box and you're good to go. <laughs> you can then keep using the rest of your old stuff. But if you try to buy stuff for the M1 Mac Mini to make it as comparable to the M1 iMac, it ends up at roughly the same price. So really, if you're looking at these two machines, know their trade-offs before finally deciding. So now we're at the conclusion. Should you personally buy the 2021 M1 iMac? Well, <laughs> everyone is tired of hearing me say this, but 
It depends. If your current computer serves your needs fine, then no, easy. Turn off the video, get off the computer, move on with your life. Or if you're looking for a Mac and your biggest concern is getting the best of value for your money, get the M1 Mac Mini. You won't regret it. It performs just as well as the iMac and costs way less and is much more customizable to fit your own personal needs. But if you're looking for an all-inclusive package with minimal setup, or maybe you need something that looks good in living spaces because of all of its cool different colors and has minimal cable clutter, well, then I think the answer is clear. The M1 iMac is the way to go. To me, I think the M1 iMac is a good machine and would be the Mac desktop that most people looking for Mac will probably end up gravitating towards. And I think it makes a great family computer or a content creator computer. It plays light games fine, surfs the web with no problem at all, and does great in video and photo editing. It won't be the Mac for everybody, but if I had the budget, I'd look at the M1 iMac before other Mac desktops. Anyway, what do you personally think? Does the M1 iMac catch your eye? Or do you lean more towards the M1 Mac Mini? Are Macs not really your thing? Are you more of a Windows person? What Windows only one machine are you looking at? Or would you never consider an all in one machine? Leave all that down in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And well, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Bye.